Christmas, Christ Mass, the birth of Jesus. For many in our culture, it's, it's become an outdated aspect of the Christmas season rather than the central reason. It's hard to watch this beautiful, big, all-consuming, glittering lights, decorations everywhere, talk of Christmas. And yet everywhere we look, it seems so hollow. Who but us is going to change this? Yes, we should be feeling immense weight around Christmas time, but that weight should not be the stress of holiday family gatherings. It should be the weight of the joy that we have knowing that Jesus has done for us what we could not do for ourselves. And it started when he was born a human baby boy. Jesus Christ coming to earth is God giving his son to us. For unto you a child has been born. So when we talk about vintage Christmas this holiday season, we're talking about vintage, meaning reaching into the, into the past and grabbing that meaning and making what is old new again because the next generations are losing the meaning and now it's our time to share what Christmas really means. That is how we begin to bring Christ back to Christmas. This is how we bring glory to God. This is how we fulfill the great responsibility that we have for those who call on the name of Jesus, that we get to speak the name of Jesus. And so church, if you want Christmas to mean more to our culture than what it does, then say it. to our online Christmas Eve service. My name is Ryan. I'm the lead pastor here at Peace Church. And I can tell you, this is not what we had planned, but this is what God has for us. And so we're going to take this opportunity with the technology to be able to worship together in spirit, celebrating the birth of Christ on this last celebration of Advent. And with that, we do light the last Advent candle. This is known as the Christ candle. As we light this candle, we are reminded that our time of anticipation, our time of waiting is over because Jesus Christ has been born. Light has come into the world. So let's start with these words. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. 
glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Church, family, and friends, wherever you are, whenever you are, let's sing together now.
and eat the trees in the garden. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You will not surely die. Here, take this. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from him among the trees. Where are you? I, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? It was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit and I ate it. What have you done? The serpent deceived me. That's why I ate it. Then God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. And on your belly you shall go, and the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So here's the scene. It's the Garden of Eden. Everything is perfect. God has created a perfect world, and he calls it very good. And at the center of this perfect world that God has created, there's not a city. There's not even a church. There's a garden. The Garden of Eden. And God creates the first man, and he gives this man the perfect job. He is to tend the garden that God has made for him. And God says to him, you are to live in this garden. You are to work this garden in this paradise that I've made for you. You can live off the fruit here. But, but God tells him, I'm still God. And there's some rules here. In fact, there's only one, and it's a very important rule. God says, you can eat of any tree in the garden, but you can't eat of the tree in the middle of the garden. This is the one rule God gives, and it's a good rule. You can't eat from the tree in the center of the garden, but God says you may eat of anything else. And then God says to the man, but you can't do this alone. You're not meant to do this alone. God says, I'm going to make a woman, and she's going to be your complement. Both created in the image of God, but you're going to work together in this garden. So God creates the woman. God creates Eve. And he brings Adam and Eve together. They get married in the garden. And God says to them, you are to work together as you love each other. And it was very good. And then enter the serpent. Now, throughout the rest of scripture, we learn that the snake is actually Satan who has come to deceive the man and the woman because that's what Satan does. He deceives. He comes as a snake and what he does changes the course of history. He asks her a question. He asks Eve this question, and honestly, I dare say this is a brilliant question. It's brilliant in how deceptively powerful it is. He comes and he asks her, Did God actually say you can't eat of any tree in the garden? Now, the devil knew this isn't what God had said. See, the devil is using a formal logical fallacy known as a straw man argument. He's intentionally mischaracterizing what God had said in order to attack it. He's twisting what God has said to create confusion and doubt. And hear me, this is still what the devil does. He twists God's word so that they, there would be confusion and doubt. Now Eve, Eve responded and said, no, God did not say that. God said that we can't eat in the tree that's in the middle of the garden. Otherwise, we'll die. And this is where Satan comes out with his left hook and he says, ha, no, you will not die. God knows that if you eat of the fruit, you'll actually be like him. The devil is saying, God is keeping the good stuff from you. He's telling Eve, if you don't eat of this fruit, you'll never be who you're fully meant to be. You'll never become fully aware. You'll never experience all there is if you don't eat of this fruit. And with this one question that started it all, with this one question, did God actually say the devil does two powerful things in the heart of Eve? The devil made Eve question God's integrity and God's intention. The devil made Eve question God's integrity if God was being honest. And he also makes her intent, uh, in question God's intention. Was it a good intention? Is God good? The devil is leading her to believe that God has no integrity, that he's lying to her, that his intentions are bad because he's trying to keep from her what is good. Here is what Satan does. 
Here's what he did to her. Here's what he still does to us. Satan makes us question God's word so that we doubt God's will. This is the trick of Satan since the beginning, and he's still doing it because it still works in the heart of so many people. Satan makes us question God's word so that we doubt God's will. And with that, Satan, having undermined Eve's trust in God, she ate of the fruit. And then, with Adam standing right there watching this all happen, he ate as well. And do you know what happened in this moment? Yes, they sinned. But in this moment, what had happened was that Adam and Eve lost their innocence. They were no longer innocent before God, but they were standing guilty before God because of their sin. And they looked at themselves and they realized they were naked. And so they felt shame and they felt ashamed. And so they hid. They ran from God. They ran from the one who truly loves them. And that's what we do with our sin. We realize we're sinful. And instead of running to God, we run from God. We run, we run from God, who is the only one who truly loves us. People have been doing this ever since. So Adam and Eve have sinned. The scandal has happened. And what happened next was the result of all this. Let's read what happened. If you have your Bibles, Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 to 15. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man and he said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, God said to Adam, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I have commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. And on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is God's word. Hey, let's take a moment. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray over this as we continue. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have, even if it's remotely through technology, to gather in spirit. Father, we just pray, God, as we think about the birth of Christ on this Christmas Eve, God, I just pray that you are glorified as we announce the birth of our Savior. Father, I pray that you'll be with everyone who can hear my voice right now. Father, as we think about and reflect on what happened in that manger 2,000 years ago, what happened on that cross, and what happened through that empty grave. Father, thank you for the salvation that's come. Thank you that light has come into the world. And we pray this in his name, in Jesus' name. Amen. So here's what I want you to do. You're probably in your home or watching this somewhere remotely. Here's what I want you to do for a moment with whoever you're with. What are one or two things that help to make Christmas special? I'm in a room here that should be full right now, but there's only like five of us here. So even for you in the room, for a moment, for you at home, what are one or two things that help make Christmas really special? Aside from the birth of Christ, take a moment, talk to those around you. If you're watching online, post, type it out. What are some, what are a couple things that make Christmas special? You know, one of the things that makes Christmas special for me is that Christmas, every year it comes, it, it gives me the hope of innocence. That Christmas reminds me of the hope of innocence, that of, uh, it reminds me of what is pure and what is clean because Christmas is about undoing what Satan had done in that garden so long ago. Christmas is about the hope of the restoration of innocence. Now, I don't want to get heavy on people here at Christmas time, but this is, this is what is so true. I love this hope of Christmas. It reminds me of what is innocent in this world. Even this pure white snow, which is keeping us from gathering together, 
as we look out and we think about and we see this beautiful white snow, it reminds me again of the purity of innocence that we can have because of the promise of Christmas. Now, what had happened in the garden was when Adam and Eve ate that fruit, they sacrificed their innocence before God. And they were standing guilty before him. Like Adam and Eve, we can't hide our sin. All that is left now is to confess. Confession that we are sinful and that we stand naked before God. That is all we can bring. In the midst of our sinfulness, we can bring confession to God. Confession that we are sinful. Confession that God is good. Listen to this line again. This is what Adam said to God. He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. That, that captures the human heart ever since. We realize our sin and instead of running to God, we hide ourselves from God in this sin. Because we have sacrificed our innocence when we sin, it's going to take a sacrifice to get our innocence back. And this this is the gospel. That God so loved the world that he gave up his son to die on a cross in our place. And that promise, that promise of the gospel was first hinted at here in Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden. Because Satan had tempted Adam and Eve and led them into sin, this is what God said to the serpent. Go to verse 15. He says, I will put enmity, that means conflict or tension or strife, I will put this between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is it. This is the prophecy to Satan. In this series, we've been having a vintage Christmas. We've been looking at the the prophecies throughout Scripture as we've looked back, having a vintage Christmas, being reminded of all the times that the Bible points towards Christmas, towards the birth of Christ. And this is the first prophecy that we have. This is the first prophecy of Christmas. This is the first promise of Christmas. Now, theologians got a big term for this. They call it the proto-evangelium. That just means it's the first gospel. As we look through the pages of Scripture, the first time we get an indication of the gospel is right here in Genesis chapter 3. That the great gift of God, that we will have salvation by grace through faith in Christ, whom God gave because he so loved the world. So here's a question for you. When do you typically open your Christmas gifts? When does that happen? Does it happen today on Christmas Eve? Do you wait till tomorrow morning? Do you wait till you gather with family? You guys here in the room, the the five of you that's here, when do you guys open presents? If you're watching online, type, when do you normally have your grand present opening? What time is that? Christmas Day? Anybody do Christmas Eve? Sometimes? See, our family, because uh, Christmas Eve is usually all wrapped up in, in uh, church, church stuff, we usually wait till Christmas morning. I think that's pretty, pretty uh, traditional for, for most people. But here's, here's what I'd say. Whenever you exchange gifts, whenever you give a gift, whenever you get a gift, tomorrow, when you're opening those gifts, please take time and be reminded that every gift we give or receive in some way is a reflection, in some way is, is its own little prophecy that points towards the birth of Christ the greatest gift that we could ever give, that that we could ever get when God gave his son to to us. I I pray that this Christmas, as we do that, you are reminded that every gift given, every gift opened is a small reminder of the greatest gift that we have in the gospel. It's the promise that God will undo the deception that Satan brought into the world. And this offspring of Eve, this this offspring that was foretold, is the son of Mary, who is God the Son, Jesus Christ. It's like that old Christian hymn that we used to sing, that old Christmas hymn. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. O tidings of comfort and joy. Christmas is not just a time, although it is, to adore the newborn King But Christmas is also a time to rejoice because our Redeemer is here. And he has come to undo what Satan has done. You see, Satan, Satan at best can only strike at the feet of Jesus, pointing to that time on the cross. But Jesus, Jesus will crush the head of Satan. Sin, 
Sin has covered our world and covered our hearts in a thick cloud of darkness. But Christmas, Christmas is where that darkness of sin was cracked by the light of the world. Christmas is that time where we are reminded of the hope that we have in the light of Jesus. So if you have not yet, put your faith in him. We have all tasted the bitter fruit of sin. It's time to taste the fruit of salvation. And that can only be had through Jesus Christ. And this is the promise that we get to see in all of its fulfillment and we get to celebrate here at Christmas. This is why we are going to stand and sing. This is our final thing we need to remember here at Christmas. When Satan makes us doubt God's goodness and faithfulness, Jesus at Christmas proves that God, God's promises are good and true. And that's why we celebrate Christmas. So wherever you are, whenever you are, let's sing about the fulfillment of God's promises because Jesus Christ is born. Let's pray. Father, we come before you thankful, thankful that we can still gather in spirit. And Lord, we do as we glorify you, as we think about our newborn king, as we worship in the power of the spirit. Father, we're all in our various homes right now, but we are united in our hearts because of the gospel of Jesus, which we celebrate now here at Christmas. Father, I pray, Lord, that your spirit would fill every home as you are uniting us together, as we think about our newborn king, as we think about our savior. It's in his name we pray, amen. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant. In that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal for all the peoples. I will raise up your offspring who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When she who is in labor has given birth to him, he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. Then the rest of his brothers shall return, and they shall dwell secure, and he shall be their peace. O oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, oh. Slave is 
Christ our brother and in his name all oppression shall see sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise we let all within us praise his holy name Christ is Lord praise his name forever his spoken to us by his son when he brings the firstborn into the world he says let all God's angels worship him you are my son today I have begotten you and again I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son and the message declared by the angels proved to be reliable because when Christ came into the world he said behold I have come to do your will O God as it is written to me in the book of the scroll I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. Now we see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. After making purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God, having become superior to angels because the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. And bringing many sons to glory, he founds and makes our salvation perfect through suffering. He is not ashamed to call us brothers, saying, Behold, the children God has given me. He had to be made like his brothers so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Now we see Jesus. Now he is able to help us. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, for he will be merciful towards our iniquities and remember our sins no more. church, family, and friends. Hopefully you have your candles. If not, here's your warning. Quick, go get them. We're still going to have a candlelight service. Even though this candles won't be lit in this building, they'll be lit, lit all over our community because as it should be, we are the light of the world. When Jesus left, he said that we are now the light of the world and we are to be spread throughout our community. And so if you have your candles, let's light them now. Now this candle, this is a special candle to me. When my grandmother passed, we went into her house and we grabbed some special things. And I grabbed a bunch of candles. These are old candles, candles that she never lit. 
Now, the beautiful thing is that my grandma is celebrating Christmas with Jesus himself in heaven. And I know that you, you may have some loved ones who are also in heaven celebrating Christmas with Jesus. Let that be a great reminder to us of the hope that we get to long for, that we will all gather at the feet of Jesus celebrating Christmas with him one day. When Jesus came into this world, he was the light of the world. And when he left, he said that we are now to carry that light. So that's what this candle represents. The birth of Christ and how we are now the light of the world. So with your candles lit, keep them lit as we sing this next song together. church, family, and friends, let's go ahead and just blow out our candles. But be reminded that the flame of the light of the world that is in us, that cannot be extinguished. Church, it was great to be able to be with you online for this service. Let me remind you, we have an amazing 
online service that's going to be available on demand all day tomorrow. You're going to laugh, you're going to cry, you're going to rejoice and celebrate our Savior. So we'll see you online tomorrow as well. And church, I want to give you an update on our year-end giving. This is something we do every year. This year we had a goal of raising $35,000 for a couple of our missionaries and for some pro-life causes. Church, I am so excited to tell you that we have raised you. We have given over $94,000 to our missionaries and to pro-life causes. That is cause for much celebration. If you want to give to this cause, there's still time. Hey, let's try and get over that 100K mark. You can do that by giving to the information on your screen. Or if you want to give to the Ministry of Peace Church, you can do that the same way. Church, again, I hope to see you online tomorrow. It's going to be a blessed day as we celebrate the birth of our Savior. The on-demand online service is pretty special. Can't wait to share that with you. And so, church, with that, let's close out Christmas Eve with this blessing. May your soul magnify the Lord and your spirit find joy in God, your Savior. For Jesus Christ is born. Hallelujah. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.